Love to everybody. Uh, she's missing you all, and uh, she can't wait, uh, like all of us, to get back together and to meet publicly and to worship together. So um, she sends her love. Uh, you know, my wife is an incredible wife to me, and I really see grace when I see Glenda because I don't deserve such a good wife, such a faithful wife uh, that makes my life such a blessing. And uh, numbers of you in City Church will know uh, that Glenda's contacting people in City Church every single day during this uh, where we can't meet time, this kind of lockdown or not allowed to meet. And, uh, and you know, so one day she, she, she connected with 24 people from City Church. I said, how do you do that? But it's just like her nature. It's, she has a pastor's heart, a mother's heart. And uh, so um, I love her, and I know City Church loves her, and she's a blessing. And uh, there's so many uh, connect group leaders, and I could mention you all by name, that are standing up and taking ownership of uh, helping people feel connected and loving them. And for that, again, we're very, very grateful. We really need to stay connected because God created us for community. So I want to talk today, the title of the, the message, it's all in your notes, but it's we need to die to what's killing us. You need to die to what's killing you. So here's the question. What kills a mighty move of the Spirit being established in Hong Kong that touches the world? What kills, what's the primary reason that stops the move of God covering the nations of the earth? Because the Bible says in Habakkuk that the, the glory of the Lord, the knowledge of God's glory will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And there's no place in the sea where the waters don't cover. So, so many places in the Word of God prophesy that in the last days, God's glory will cover the earth, and the glory is the tangible substance of God's goodness. Mighty signs and wonders and miracles happen effortlessly in the glory. They just take place uh, by just divine power moving throughout the earth. Now, it's God's will to pour out His Spirit on all flesh, Joel 2, Acts 2. God is going to sum up history with the greatest outpouring of His glory on this planet. What stops the move of the Spirit in Hong Kong? What kills the move of the Spirit in nations and churches around the world? Now, some people will say, well, it's too much sin. Now, I want to tell you that the new covenant does not encourage sin. The new covenant gives you power to overcome sin. But I don't believe it's because sin, sin is not stopping the moving of the Spirit, my friends. Because if it was sin stopping the move of the Spirit, then there must be uh, much sin going on globally around the world. I mean, the church must be saturated in sin if sin stops miracles. Uh, because there is very little high-level miracles in the church worldwide. And the reason is it's not sin stopping the miracles. Some of the greatest miracles happen in the context context of sin, because when miracles happen, it reveals God's grace for sinners and people bound to come to know God's a miracle worker. He's a good God. He's got the good news of the kingdom. He wants to save you, wants to deliver you from a bondage and addiction to sin. So sin is not stopping miracles. I know many Christians that have very little sin in their life. There are so many Christians who, who live a good moral life. They're decent people. They've got so little sin in their life but they also have so little of the Spirit, so little of miracles. I know atheists, I know people from other religions and Christians who lead a good life, pretty much moral life, but they have no evidence of the miraculous supernatural power of God that Jesus prophesied that those that believe in Him, the miracles I do, believers will do also. These signs will follow them that believe. They'll lay hands on the sick and the sick will recover. Every believer is a miracle worker. And yet, across the earth, what's happening? Dryness, sterileness, religion, rituals, ceremony, and traditions. It is not sin stopping the power of God. I'll tell you what it is. Here's the answer. It's been married to the wrong husband. Now, don't hit your husband in the ribs with your elbow. I'm not talking about a human husband. In Romans chapter 4, from verse 1, uh, sorry, Romans 7, from verse 1 to 4, Paul argues the case that a wife cannot be married to two husbands at the same time. 
And he argues the case that the law is a husband or Jesus is a husband. And he's arguing the case, you cannot be married to Jesus and married to the law. We, the bride of Christ, must make up our mind, who is our husband? Is our husband the law or is our husband Jesus? If your husband is the law of Moses, you cannot belong to Jesus. If Jesus is your husband, you cannot belong to the law. See, Paul writes this. He says, under the old covenant law, you cannot divorce your husband while he's still alive. Because if you divorce your husband while he's still alive and marry someone else, that's called adultery. Now, that's under the law. I'm not talking about the new covenant now. So, Paul is saying, you can't divorce the law. You can't just go divorce the law and marry Jesus because the law will never die. And so the good news, Paul says, is that the law doesn't die, but you die to the law so that you can belong to Jesus. Now, friends, you've got to catch this. This is so clear. You see, the law is a useless husband. The law, if you marry to the law, if you belong to the law, you cannot belong to Jesus. And if you belong to Jesus, you cannot be married to the law. You see, the law is a useless husband. The law just gives you constant judgment. The law gives you accusation. The law points out your faults. But the law cannot help you. The law cannot help you succeed. The law is a sterile husband. The law has no seed. The law cannot impregnate you. The law can't make you fruitful. The law can't deliver you. The law can't help you. The law can just point out your faults, accuse you, and the law's always right. And you're living with a husband that is dead, sterile, and powerless. And that's what stops the move of the Spirit. Nothing else stops the move of the Spirit except being married to the wrong husband. And so if you want to live in the new way of the Spirit and the supernatural, you have to have revelation that in Christ you've died to the law so that you can belong to someone else, Jesus Christ, and be released from what once bound you and flow in the new way of the Holy Spirit and, and no longer under the bondage of the written code. So we're going to look quickly now at Romans chapter 7, and we're going to read verse 4. And we're going to read verse 6. So it's going to come up on your screen there. Praise God. Now let's read it. Romans 7 verse 4. So my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law. Think about that. You've died to the law. You cannot be deader than dead. If you are dead, you're dead. And so my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law. You died to that old useless husband through the body of Christ, through the body of Christ. To, from what happened on the cross, in Christ you died to the law, that you might belong. Say belong. That's the key word, that you might belong to another. To belong to another means you no longer belong to the law. The law has no authority over you. You've died to the law. You belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. If you want to be fruitful, if you want to see the supernatural fruit of the Spirit in your life, you need to have revelation that you're dead to the law. Stop going back to that old husband, the law. It's called spiritual adultery, and it's even worse than physical adultery. Don't go back to that weak and useless husband. Jesus does not accuse you. Jesus does not condemn you. Jesus blesses you. Jesus redeems you. Jesus has made you righteous in the eyes of the Father. Jesus is a powerful husband. He's a potent husband. He has seed. He has word that can fill you with the Spirit and anoint you with the power of the supernatural seed. He is the greatest husband you could ever imagine to the bride of Christ. But if you go back to the law, you don't belong to Jesus. You're committing spiritual adultery. And that's why the church has been stopped around the world from a mighty move of the Spirit. They are committing spiritual adultery, going from the law to Jesus, back to the law, back to Jesus, and mixing the husbands up. Paul makes it clear from Romans 7, verse 1 to verse 6, that you have to be released 100% from the law. You need to be uh, clear. You are dead to that useless husband and stay faithful to the husband who can bless you and empower you. Now look at this. Look at... Uh, uh, Verse 6 now, in the same chapter. But now, by dying to, one, 
what once bound us. Listen, that old husband bound you up. He beat you up. He molested you, and he oppressed you, and he accused you, and the devil got behind the law as well and brought psychological trauma into your life because you never felt good enough no, no, no matter how hard you tried. But, but now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released, powerful word, released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit. The new covenant is a new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. The majority of Christians around the world do not understand what I've just told you. They don't live in that because I promise you, I can tell you without doing any research, how's how I know. If you are free from the law, if you know you're dead to the law and released from what once bound you, you are now living in the new way of the Spirit and as a result, supernatural power is operating on your life. You now belong to Him that was raised from the dead so you can produce fruit unto God. You, how do I know someone's free from the law, dead to the law in their understanding? The fruit of their life, the fruit of the power of the Holy Spirit upon their life. And people want to go back and just go through 40 days of fasting to try to get the Spirit to come back. Listen, the Spirit is always here, but He's not going to move on your life if you want to be married to the law. The law is powerless. The law is sterile. But if you realize you haven't divorced the law. You've died to the law, and you've been released from the law because it once bound you. Now you can walk with a husband that's full of grace, full of kindness, accepts you. He is your favor. He's your righteousness. He's your wisdom. He's your holiness. He's your covenant. He's your covenant that he made with the Father on your behalf, and you are in Christ Jesus. Now, what? let's have a look at this. The law kills. Now, we're going to look quickly at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to look at verse uh, 5 and 6, all right? Paul writes this, and he says, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us, City Church, He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. See, the Lord does never want City Church to be competent ministers of the letter, competent ministers of the old code, competent ministers of a confusing, false gospel. He wants us to be competent ministers of of the Spirit, for the new covenant, the new way of the Spirit. When you dead to the law, automatically, spontaneously, the flow of the anointing will increase in your life. But the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And so many people go to church, and they get the ministry of the letter competently communicated to them. And they, and they hear instructions about regulations and rules and how to behave and how to conform and how to be a great churchgoer, but it leaves them dead. It kills the move of the Spirit. We don't want competency in the letter. We want competency in the new covenant, in the new and the living way. We are dead to the law. We're alive to Christ. We belong to Him, and through Him we bear fruit supernaturally unto God. Bearing fruit doesn't take effort. A tree and a branch doesn't try and bear fruit by its own effort. You can't put a law on the tree. Bear fruit. But when you are connected to the life, when you're connected to the flow, you will start seeing miracles, healings, life. You'll hear the voice of God. The anointing will purify your heart, heal your heart. The anointing will lift bondage off you, take the yokes off you. You'll walk in the supernatural of the Holy Spirit. It just flows. It's not about how much you pray. It's not about how much you fast. It's not about how holy you are. It's about believing the truth, the simplicity. You're dead to the law. You belong to Jesus, and now you bear fruit unto God because you are a competent minister of the Spirit not of the letter, for the letter kills. What is the letter? The letter is the law. And I want to explain to you that the letter, which is the law, is that which was written on tablets of stone. And I want to tell you the Bible says that when the law came, it's a ministry of condemnation. And it's a ministry that came with glory. So even though 
the law is a ministry of death. It's a ministry of condemnation. It comes and arrives with glory, but that glory fades away. That glory is temporary. That glory uh, decreases and decreases and then disappears, and I'll explain to you in a moment. But the gift of righteousness in the new covenant, not only does it come with glory, but the new covenant glory keeps increasing and increasing and increasing. When you come into revelation of, of, of the new covenant, you get anointed, but you've got to understand if you stay with the one husband, Jesus, and keep the revelation, you're dead to the law. It has no authority over you. If you stay with the one husband, you should be experiencing ever-increasing glory, ever-increasing anointing on your life. But if you go back to that old husband, the glory starts fading away, and it starts declining. Don't fast to get the glory back. You didn't lose the glory for lack of fasting. You lost the glory because you went back to the wrong husband who will kill the move of the Spirit, who will stop the move of the Spirit because that husband can't produce the life of God. When you feel the, the glory or the anointing decreasing in your life, don't try anything else except repent and say, Father, I'm sorry I committed spiritual adultery with the law. I repent of adultery with the law. I'm going back to my husband, Jesus, and you will see the spirit of life immediately start flowing through your life again. And stay with the same husband for the rest of your life, Jesus, and you'll see ever-increasing glory. Even as I'm talking now, I'm trying to calm down because I feel the energy of the power of the anointing on me as I'm speaking, and I must slow down because Christine is trying to translate simultaneously. But let's read uh, 2 Corinthians. Uh, well, we've just read that. So now we're going to see that the letter is the law. So here we go. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 to tw 12. Calm down, Rob. Calm down. Okay. Now, if the ministry that brought death, what a horrible thing. Imagine having a ministry that kills people, the letter, and it brings death. Now, the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, that is the Ten Commandments, graved on letters on stone. If that came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory, temporary, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? That's the new covenant gift of righteousness. Verse 10, for what was glorious has no glory now. I want to say to you, under the law, what was glorious has no, zero glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory that is of the new covenant. And if what was transitory, temporary, fading away, came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lost? And if you read on, Paul speaks about the ever-increasing glory, from glory to glory to glory. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. You see, people who lose hope lose boldness. If you realize that the covenant you're in is an ever-increasing glory, it's not a glory that comes and then fades. It's not an anointing that fills your life up and then lasts for a week or two, and then you spend a couple of months dry, and then it comes back a little bit, and then you spend 10 years dry. This is an ever-increasing glory. This is an ever-increasing of the manifestation of the anointing because you are free from the ministry of death. You are died to the law so that you can belong to him who was raised from the dead. And you stay with the right husband and you will see the power of God increasing and increasing. So, I'm nearly finished, by the way. Oh, for you see in these days, revelation is flowing freely, unlimited, and you shall see your life begin to ascend into the supernatural. You will rise up and you'll see the manifestation of the power of God that you dreamed of. And even some of you have had dreams and the night hours and you've seen yourself doing supernatural things. And then during the waking hours, you said, oh no, Lord, I could never do that. Go with the dreams. Go with what God put in your heart. Believe what's in your heart more than
than what you see around you. Do not let the temporary around you dominate you or subject you to it. It is temporary, subject to change, fickle, but inside of you is the eternal Word of God, the eternal assignment of God. And so rise up and believe the dreams God's put in you. Believe in the visions. Believe in the voice of God. Believe the things that you've always thought was the truth, but someone told you that's wrong and that's deception. It's not deception. The law, living under law is deception. Living with Christ is the truth. You, he died to set you free from the law. You died to the law so you can walk in the supernatural. Don't waste your life living somewhere between the two husbands or husband to husband. Stop talking about, well, Christians live a yo-yo life, up sometimes, down sometimes, cold sometimes, hot sometimes. What you're really describing in that is a husband to husband relationship. Christians go from Jesus back to the law and the law beats them up and so they go back to Jesus and then they feel guilty because he loves them so much and he's got so much grace and their friends from legalism say, oh, you're just deceived. So they go back to the law. They're living husband to husband. It's not yo-yo up and down, not cold and hot. It's a spiritual adultery, husband to husband. Stay with the one husband permanently and you will see the glory of God increasing on your life. Now, here's the issue. Why under the law is it a ministry of death? Is the law bad? The law is holy. The Ten Commandments are holy. There's nothing wrong with the law. The problem with the Ten Commandments is this. When God looks at you through the lenses, the lenses, or the view and opinion of the law, then you've got to go back to Matthew 5 and see Jesus teaching the full, holy exactitudes of the law. The law is not just moral law. The law is spiritual. The law sees of your heart is lusting after someone who's not your husband or wife. The law says you're committing spiritual adultery. That's what the law says. The exactitudes of the law are so high and so perfect that God designed it that way, that you would never be deceived to stay under the law. It will kill you. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a ministry of death. And so if you hate someone without cause, Jesus says the law says you're a murderer. And, and no one will be justified under the law. And in fact, James 2 verse 10 says, if you keep most of the law but fail in one part, you're guilty of breaking all of the law. God designed it to be impossible for human beings to keep it. Jesus kept the law perfectly on your behalf. Jesus measured up for you. Jesus measured up for you. He kept the law for you, and then he died on the cross for you to die to the law, to belong to him as your husband. So if you want to live under the law, if you want to live under that husband, if you want to live that way in your thinking, then God has to. You force God to do it. God doesn't want to do it. If you think self-righteousness, if your boldness is not in the gift of righteousness, if your boldness is on your performance, then you've shifted your thinking, and God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble and lifts the humble up by His mighty hand. If you think you can live under the law, you force God to look at you through different lenses. When He looks at you through the exactitudes of the law, all He can see is sin and unrighteousness and failure, and God has to walk away from you. The glory has to fade. The glory has to decrease. The anointing has to decrease and then disappear because it's God's looking at you through the lenses of the law. But if you believe you're married to Jesus and dead to the law, and you live in the new way of the Spirit, and you believe that you're justified and declared righteous in Christ through the cross, then God looks at you through the lenses of the cross. And when He looks at you through the lenses of the cross, He sees perfection. He sees that you're innocent, you're unstained, you're holy, you have fullness in Him. You are made complete in Christ through the finished work of the cross. And when He sees you through the finished work of the cross, He sees you in perfection. He sees you holy. He sees you clean. He's not lying. He's not an idiot. He's Almighty God. He's doing this with full wisdom and understanding, Ephesians 1 says. He's doing it out of His own initiative because He's looking at you through the lenses of the cross, and He sees you holy and perfect. And so He can embrace you. He can hug you, and His glory keeps increasing, and His glory never needs to leave you. You see, Moses always had God walking away from him. God, Moses said, show me your glory. God said, I can't show you my glory because of the law. God had to walk away, and Moses had to see the hind parts, the fading glory. 
And God, Moses had to put something of his face because the glory was constantly fading. Temporary covenant that some Christians are still married to today. Fading glory covenant that's over. It never came through the cross. The law never passed through the cross. We're redeemed from the curse of the law. Colossians makes it clear. God, the, the law cannot come through the cross. But if you want the law, then you go back in front of the cross, go back into that period, a ministry of death that kills the move of the Spirit, you will see the Spirit of God fade off your life. But if you stay in the new covenant thinking with the new covenant husband, you will see the glory of God ever increasing because the way the Lord sees you is through the finished work of the cross. Now, friends, when you see yourself through the eyes of God, when you see yourself the way the Father sees you in Christ Jesus, you will see yourself as beautiful and awesome. And when you see yourself through the eyes of the Father, you will be bold and the anointing of the Spirit will increase on your life. The blessing of God, the intimacy with God, the supernatural will increase on your life. You know, what is the point of God seeing you so beautiful, but you see yourself so ugly? What is the point of God seeing you in Christ so beautifully, but you choose to see yourself so ugly because you're married to the wrong husband who's always saying you're ugly? What's the point of believing in God if you don't believe that God believes in you? I'm so tired of people that say they believe in God. Anybody can believe in God. James chapter 2 says demons believe in God and tremble. It's not a big thing to believe in. God. That's the easiest thing in the world. But if you believe in God, do you believe that God believes in you? Do you believe that God believes in you? Because if you believe that God believes in you, you will get your definition of your identity from the way God sees you. But if you don't see the way God sees you through Christ, you will get your definition of your identity from other Christians who are legalistic. You'll get your definition of your identity from the law, which will make you very insecure and dry you up spiritually. But if you see yourself the way God sees you, if you believe in God, but you also more importantly, believe that God believes in you, then the way God sees you is the way you will see yourself, and you will walk in great boldness with great hope and mighty supernatural anointings on your life. Amen and amen. Now, I, I want to read you, and we're nearly finished, very close now. Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to read that in a moment. I want to just tell you before we read that, God didn't have to think in a last moment, oh, I think I'll see them through Christ. He decided this before time began. He decided this before the foundation of the world, that in the gospel, in Christ, Christ was the ultimate climax and consummation of all God's plans. Everything that happened to Christ was shadow, but in Christ, the eternal purpose of God was manifested in Christ. All the wisdom of God is in Christ. There's nothing to add to Christ. You are made complete in Christ. So, in Christ, God chose you. When you responded to the gospel, God chose to see you through His eyes as holy, as righteous, and as innocent. He chose to see you as His beloved. He chose to see you in perfection. Now, God chose that. Now, when you get revelation how God sees you, it will open your spiritual eyes, and you will see yourself the way God sees you. When you see yourself the way God sees you, a whole lot of inner healing is going to take place, a whole lot of deliverance, a whole lot of freedom, and a whole lot of liberty, and a lot of anointing. But you will see in these verses, when you see yourself the way God sees you through Christ, you're going to see that He loves you exactly the way he loves Jesus, um, and then your heart will be open to practical wisdom, then your heart will be open to see how the big plan of God is working out, you'll see what his final plan for heaven and earth is, you'll see where you fit in. Listen, if you don't see yourself as God sees you, but you stay under the law and you see yourself as the law sees you, the glory will fade on your life, you'll be ignorant and live in darkness as to the plans of God on the earth right now, and you'll be caught up with all kinds of weird end day events and weird teaching about the devil taking over and the church having to escape from this earth in a rapture. No, the glory of God's going to fill the whole earth and you're going to see the church operating in the full power of the gospel, the real gospel, and we're going to see billions brought to Christ in these days. So I want to I read this now and I want you to see yourself as the Father sees you through His eyes. In your heart, just say this, I want to see myself 
through his eyes. I don't want to see myself through my eyes. I don't want to see myself through the Lord's eyes. I don't want to see myself through Christians' eyes. I want to see myself through God's eternal eyes, his perfect eyes. I want to see myself the way my Father sees me in Christ. Well, here we go. Ephesians chapter 1. Let's read it, verse 4 to 10. Follow these tremendous words right now. This is the Word of God. And He chose us to be His very own, joining us to Himself even before He laid the foundation of the universe. Because of His great love, He ordained us so that He would be seen, so that we, let me say that again, so that we, say me, so that me would be seen as holy in His eyes with an unstained innocence, unstained innocence. For it was always in His perfect plan to adopt us as His delightful children. Through our union with Jesus, the anointed one, so that His tremendous love that cascades over us would glorify His grace. For the same love He has for His beloved one, Jesus, He has for us. And this unfolding plan brings Him great pleasure. Since we are now joined to Christ, we have been given the treasures of redemption by His blood, the total cancellation of our sins, all because of the cascading riches of His grace. This super abundant grace is already powerfully working in us, releasing within us all forms of wisdom and practical understanding. And through the revelation of the anointed one, he unveiled his secret desires to us. God unveils to those who see themselves the way the Father sees you. He unveils his secret wisdom because we become his friends, his confidence. He unveiled his secret desires to us, the hidden mystery of his long-range plan, which he was delighted to implement from the very beginning of time. And because of God's unfailing purpose, this detailed plan will reign supreme through every period of time until the fulfillment of all the ages finally reaches its climax when God makes all things new in all of heaven and earth through Jesus Christ. You see, when you get the big picture of, of what God's plan for this universe is, you don't live in a little box. You don't live just inward looking. You live with a grand plan, a grand scheme. You are a partner with God in the great grand plan. And so you need to see this. So let me close with this. I want to say this that when your eyes are open to the finished work of the cross, make sure that the evil one does not come to try to deceive you again. Now, you do need to just take that very serious because there are case after case after case after case. People get free. People get their eyes open to the truth. They start moving in the spirit, and then the devil comes, religious Christians come, and they intimidate, and they bring you back under the law. They capture you, and they imprison you back under the law. They lead you into spiritual adultery, and you let them. And But behind all of that deception, the Bible will show you now, is evil spirits. It is evil, demonic spirits that doesn't want the church to get free. Because if the church understands what I'm saying today— and this is a basic, simple, foundational message that all believers should be able to preach themselves. It is so basic, it is so self-evident, and it is so clear. The tragedy is most of the church hears this message and then just goes on with their traditions. But I tell you, in these days, God is violently breaking into the earth to deliver the church from slavery to the wrong husband, which is a murderer. He kills that husband destroys. It's a ministry of death. And I tell you this, well, God doesn't murder. The Lord doesn't murder. The Lord just brings the justice and it will kill you. But this new husband brings the flow of the spirit of life. Listen, if your eyes are open, stay open. Keep confessing for the 21 days the truth of who you are in Christ. I am now in Christ, hidden in Christ, in God. I am now 
hidden in Christ in God. I am now hidden in Christ. Where's Christ? At the right hand of the Father. You are hidden in Christ, in God. Everything Christ has is given to you. It belongs to you. Stay free from evil religious demons, evil spirits that operate through religious people who want to bring you back to the wrong husband. Stay free, for the anointing will keep increasing. The glory will keep increasing. Do not go back under the law. If you go back under the law, I promise you, you'll see an immediate deduction in the power of the Spirit. And within days or weeks, you'll see a decrease of the anointing. And more and more, you'll be wondering, where is God? And my connection with God seems to be broken. Many Christians say, I can't hear God. No, because you're with the wrong husband. That's why. But as soon as you come to the right husband, your connection is open. Stay with your eyes open in Christ Jesus. Otherwise, if you go back to that law, it'll be an evil spirit leading you to the wrong husband, and you will see an immediate reduction. The miracles, the signs, and the wonders, and the power of God has got nothing to do with keeping the law. It's believing what happened on the cross and seeing yourself the way the Father sees you. Let's close with these two verses, and then we literally are closed. Okay, here we go. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. Look for the words evil and look for the words um, eyes. One, two, three, go. What has happened to you, Galatians, to be acting so foolishly? You must have been under some evil spell. Didn't God open your eyes to see the meaning of Jesus' crucifixion? Wasn't he revealed, revelation, to you as the crucified one? And then you'll see in verse 5, let me ask you again. What does the lavish, wonderful, that lavish, what does the lavish, how many Christians are living in a lavish supply? What does the lavish supply of the Holy Spirit in your life and the miracles of God's tremendous power have to do with you keeping religious laws? The Holy Spirit is poured out upon us through the revelation and the power of faith, not by the keeping of the law. Now, friends, this is so self-evident. It's so repeated over and over again in the New Testament. You have to be foolish and blind not to see this truth. It is self-evident. It is clear. If you read the Scriptures in their context, the New Testament is a love letter perfumed with the aromas of Christ, your wonderful husband. And if you stay with him and don't commit adultery with the law, you will see the ever-increasing power and anointing of God never fading on your life, but actually increasing on your life. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, that every believer in Christ is dead to the law. And may they, by wisdom and revelation today, know confirming grace and favor on their life to be supernaturally, psychologically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually fully delivered from the old husband because they have died to him in Christ Jesus. May they live in connection belonging to Christ Jesus, the res resurrected Lord, bearing fruit unto God, moving in the new way of the Spirit, not in the letter that kills. And Father, if there's anyone that is still connected to the law spiritually because they're not born again, anyone in Hong Kong, Anyone listening to the Chinese translation? Anyone listening to the English translation? Anyone in Hong Kong? Anywhere around the world? If you are not a believer in Christ, I tell you, God loves you. God's already predestined you in love, but you have to make the choice. Nobody is automatically saved. There will be multitudes in hell that it was not God's will for them to go there, and you never get out. Please don't think there's an escape out of hell. Don't believe the Catholic doctrine that speaks about purgatory where you go there for a little while and then you get out. There's nothing in the entire Bible to back up that heresy. Jesus spoke more about hell than anyone else, and he's full of mercy. And the new covenant after the cross speaks about judgment. A holy God has no other option but to bring judgment upon those who've rebelled against his majesty, have rejected all of the creator's design and purpose, who've just been in rebellion, and have submitted themselves to unbelief and deception. No one will have an excuse about this Jesus. Everyone will know in their hearts, when God judges you, he will be right. You can see he's a loving God. He's a holy God, but he'll judge with justice and integrity and in truth. Everyone must confess Jesus as Lord and believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead. Everyone. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me because there was no one born of a virgin. Every other guru and leader was born of a natural dad, seed, and came from
from Adam. All are fallen and corrupted by the fall of Adam and Eve. But Jesus Christ is lost Adam, who came through virgin birth by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. No one died for your sins on the cross. It is ludicrous to say all religions lead to heaven. No, reli no religion leads to heaven. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Through his virgin birth, his perfect life, and his death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, and his ascension and exaltation to the highest place. The anointing is the evidence that Christ is alive from the dead. The very presence of God, of God on me now shows me Jesus is raised from the dead. Now, if you've never asked Jesus to come into your life, or you're not sure whether you're truly born again, maybe you just bought into a mixture of law and Christianity, but you've never been born again in your spirit. Here's your answer. This is why you've struggled for so long. This is why you just keep drifting away from God, because you haven't been born again. If you need to be born again today, I tell you, this is the guarantee. As you receive Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart, God raised Him from the dead. This day, you will die to the law. This day, you will die to condemnation. You will die to accusation. All your sins, past, present, and future, are gone. You stand innocent before God. He looks at you as holy, justified, because of Christ crucified, not the law, because of Christ. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for anyone in Hong Kong or anywhere else around the world listening, if you have not received Jesus truly as Lord, if you've not had revelation that, you're, that the gospel is not the law, the law is not the gospel. If you thought you could get saved by a bit of the law and a bit of Jesus, you're not saved. You need to understand you've got to die to the law in Christ, believe on the Lord Jesus, and trust in grace alone. If you need to confess Jesus, I want you just to pray this with me. Father, I thank you. I come to you today. And I want to call you Father, not just a distant God. Thank you for loving this earth so much that you gave your only begotten Son. And I believe on the Lord Jesus today. And I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that he was raised from the dead. And I receive Jesus today, Lord, into my life. And I thank you for the miracle of salvation that I become a new creation today, and I'm set free, and I'm dead to the law, and from today, my Father sees me as innocent, holy, righteous. Fill me with the Spirit. Fill me with your presence, Lord, and I will follow you and walk with you all the days of my life to the end of the age. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Well, God bless you. Thank you, and uh, this has been, uh, I've so enjoyed this whole series, and as I say, We'll write one or two chapters more in the book, but get ready for next week. It's going to be a great, great time. I pray that you see that I am spending time at the end of the message talking about the lost. I believe God wants to awaken all of us to the condition of the lost. There's so much false teaching out there that just says everyone's going to heaven. That's a blasphemous lie against Jesus. Blasphemy, I'm not saying blasphemy means you've lost your salvation. Blasphemy means to dishonor the truth of someone. Jesus made it clear, no one automatically gets saved. But once you do get saved, you're saved forever, and you're secure forever because you're in Christ. But we need to awaken more and more to the urgent desire to see more and more people saved in Hong Kong and around the world. So bless you, and the anointing of God's upon you. And I declare, Lord, let that anointing increase every single day in the lives of all the people of City Church International Hong Kong.